Hello and welcome to the 585 Report, everyone. Uh, I am your host, Ryan Sullivan. No Mitch this week. We couldn't get our time zones lined up this week, so it's just me, but we have a special guest. Nate Geary from WGR 550. How you doing today, Nate? I'm good, man. I'm good. I uh, long day on the golf course today. I gotta long imagine one. is it busy? I got today was a really nice day. Was it was it a busy day out there? It was, yeah. Uh, and the the round just went way longer than I wanted it to go. But you know, that's 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 what you get sometimes. But no, it was a beautiful day. It was just very windy. It was very hard to. Uh, it's it's just hard to putt when it's really fast greens and it hasn't rained in a while. And then you add in the fact that there's 20 mile per hour winds. It makes it makes things pretty tough. I could barely golf when there's perfect conditions. I can only imagine what it was like on a day like today. Indeed. But we're, we'll jump right into it. So the theme of this episode is kind of resetting the AFC mm. and where the Bills fit into all this stuff. And we 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 had them. We originally going to meet with Nate a little while ago. But our schedule, our, we had them schedules ran a little bit. So we were originally going to talk a little bit about the Julio Jones thing because it was right after mm -hmm. when that happened. But we're going to kind of start out by sandwiching this with what the Bills did this offseason and what they can do and talk a little more broadly. So one of the things I think teams are what Bills fans kind of got, some Bills fans got upset with or annoyed with was their – the Bills didn't seem to want to manipulate the salary cap as much. Mm. And you saw what teams like the Titans did going to get Julio Jones. They didn't have a, a a lot of space. And some of these teams that are really kicking the can down the road, like the Saints have for years and the Rams have for years. So looking at this Bills team and, and where they are in their window, what level of manipulation are you comfortable with when it comes to maximizing this window how much should the bills be comfortable kicking that can down the road in your opinion yeah i mean it's a good question i i, I think there's a there's a healthy balance between the two right i think um you know you don't really want to end up in a situation um like the saints are when you're having to cut good veteran starting players um, you know, that, that's a team that hasn't drafted well. They've also been very aggressive trading future first round picks that kind of whiffed on Marcus Davenport. So here's the thing. If you're a team that wants to, you know, quote unquote, kick the can down the road, you have to be a couple of things. You have to be a team that drafts well. Um, and you have to be a team that finds way to finds, you know, creative ways to, to generate more assets to draft good players. So, you know, whether that means, you know, uh, trading away a veteran player a year before his cliff, which is what I think sustained the Patriots dynasty for so long, right? Like they were able to move on from guys, lawyer Malloy, Corey Dillon, all these great, even Randy Moss, like they move on from these guys right at the right time. They maximize the, um, you know, the, the value in the player on the field, and then they move them before that value is diminishing. And I, and I think that's sort of the, the, the play that Brandon Bean is trying to uh, not necessarily emulate or, or copycat, but so much is, is, is just trying to create a healthy balance of which, because I think, you know, the, 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 the bills are in a position right now um, that for me, it, it's hard to, it, it's hard to say that you didn't want them to go get Julio Jones. I, I was a part of the, um, the group of people that would have loved to go or, or at least just be a player in the Julio Jones trade. Right. Um, Cause I, I don't think that ultimately the, the, the price was too much, but I listen, I think if you're the Tennessee Titans, you're in a different position than the bills. You can restructure, um, you know, Ryan Tannehill's deal right now and potentially put yourself in a situation that the LNF Falcons are in, which are, which is, you know, a situation with a veteran quarterback who may not really be the guy that you want anymore, but you can't get rid of, um, and no one's going to trade for. So, you know, and, and Matt Ryan maybe has a year or two of, you know, average to above average football left, but I mean, it's, it's clearly his skill sets diminishing his arm strengths diminishing. Do you don't want to get to the point with Ryan Tannehill where you've kicked the can down the the road so far as so much as the saints have you know where drew Brees' arm is shot i mean they, they 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 had really the shell of drew Brees for the last two seasons and part of the reason that he held so much leverage in wanting to come back was because they put themselves in such a salary cap situation that if he were to walk away like he did um they would have been liable for a lot they got creative and you know ultimately kicking that can with drew Brees down the road so you know for the bills they don't have the luxury of having that guy under contract 
uh, to be able to 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 maneuver that con uh, to the, the contract around in a way that that extends out, adds a couple of voidable years to the end of the contract. The Bills are in a position where they need to pay their quarterback coming up, and I don't think you can start to really do those moves until your quarterback is locked in long term. You understand what his cap figure is going to be, um, and there's a lot of talk that the Bills and Josh Allen, in particular Josh Allen, would be willing to structure his contract in a way that gives the Bills flexibility to add voidable years. You know, a 10, 11, 12 year contract like we saw from. Patrick Mahomes so that there, there there's that opportunity for the franchise to get creative to, to create cap space to stay as competitive as possible throughout the process and I, I think I really like that point you hit about about Josh's contract because I I think you hit the nail on the head that you no know, the Tennessee knows exactly what Tannehill's contract is going to look like mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't know what Josh's contract is going to be is it going to be eight years is it going to be five yeah. years what is that contract going to look like so you don't have that comfortability knowing what what they might be able to do down the line. So they're a little bit handcuffed in that way, even though, though they're still paying them that rookie contract value. And I think the other good point that you really bring up here is that, you know, they're just different spots in their career. Me and Mitch talked about this a little while ago. When you have a quarterback towards the end of your career and you know that window's closing, you kind of have to do that. The same thing mm -hmm. in Tannehill, you know, Tannehill's not going to be their next quarterback for the next 10 years. And at the end of the day, if they don't win a Super Bowl and Tannehill regresses at some point, they're going to be stuck paying Tannehill at the end of his career because there's not really going to be an out on the back end of that. So add in to Ryan, add in the fact that you don't really know how much longer you're going to get of this level of Derrick Henry, you know, history and, you know, just, you know, common sense when you're evaluating the running back position, they get to this point, especially a guy with the mileage that, that Derrick Henry has, maybe you have one or two more seasons of elite level Derrick Henry. And, and history says there's a really sharp drop off. This isn't, and, and LaShawn McCoy proved that. And that's a guy with far less of those physical mileage that, that a guy like Derrick Henry had. In fact, what LaShawn McCoy's career was extended by mostly was his in a bit or his ability to sort of avoid taking those big hits. And he wasn't inviting that contact like Derrick Henry um, often does. So I, I think that's sort of even maybe in the back of Tennessee's mind even more is let's take advantage of this window that we have with an elite level running back who is an MVP caliber 2000 yard having type running back. And if you can create that situation between um, the running back and having a elite set of wide receivers, I think, you know, you're, you're set for a small window. The question is, can that defense stop anybody? I'm not sure. And well, that's the other big thing is that they're still neglecting their defense. We'll get into that. We, we kind of rank our contenders. And the last thing I'll kind of put on that is I think, you know, going all in looks great. Like the Eagles, they went all in and they won their Super Bowl, and then it at least softens the kind of hole that they're in now with, with having to eat that Carson Wentz contract and stuff. Mm -hmm. if, if Tennessee, if they don't win a Super Bowl, and they end up in a situation where they have bad Ryan Tannehill, bad Derrick Henry, and they're 20 mil over the cap, you know, it just doesn't look great. And I know it's right. kind of, you know, an unfair measurement on if it worked or not, but, you know, the Saints are going to almost be in that same situation in a couple of years if it doesn't work out with Jameis or whoever they roll out here this year. So, you know, it's not the most accurate measurement, but I think that's something you have to consider, at least from a management perspective. Um, yeah, 100% too. And, you know, like the last thing on that is it, it, you're right in that there always has to be an eye to the future and an eye to the present. And I think teams and general managers and people that are in charge of these roster construction um, across the league, if you look at the Bills, the Bills did a great job retaining and, and, and historically retaining talent. Is a real is really the difficult thing to do. The, the easy thing is to go out and say, "Hey, you know, we're gonna let Matt Milano walk, and we're gonna go ahead and pay Joe Schobert. We're gonna go pay whoever, right? Like whoever the last two seasons um, was was a uh, was a linebacker, and you could say we're gonna go out and sign somebody else. But instead, you're retaining the talent that you drafted. And think about the value that the Bills have gotten out of Matt Milano as a former fifth round pick. This is a player that, you know, over the last four seasons and on his rookie deal is performing way outside of his rookie deal parameters. So now, you know, he's slotted in, I think maybe more appropriately, but in the grand scheme of things, the Bills paid less than what I believe the market value for Matt Milano would have been had he gotten out to free agency um, and a team like the Browns or the Patriots, I think, right? Would have had a crack at him. I, I think, you know, he would have paid been, been paid significantly 
more than what he ended up signing with the Bills. And I think I think you'll see that trend continue on. I think you saw the same thing with Darrell Williams, and and I think you saw the same thing with Deion Dawkins and Trey White. I mean, look at Miami. You know, Xavier Howard's already looking to get more money after he agreed to the deal the year prior, um, and now he's you know the sixth highest paid corner, not the top paid corner. And I think I tweeted this like a week and a half ago, you know, in the world of Xavier Howard's, get yourself a Trey White, a guy that is going to sign a contract, shut up and and put up for that contract. And, and I think when you start to look across the, the roster and you see all these guys taking those deals, uh, it sets them up to get aggressive. But when you have really great talent that isn't being overpaid by three, four, five, some cases, 10 million. I think Bud Dupree was grossly overpaid for where he is in his career that coming off the ACL injury. That's a team that I didn't think needed to really invest that type of crazy money in that position with the, the draft capital they've spent there. But yeah, I, I, it's, it's, it's an interesting scenario within Tennessee and how they're going to structure things. But I think the bills have a really good mix of you know, guys that are looking not to take deals, but to take team friendly contracts in order to make it flexible so that they can they can remain competitive. And I think that's the that's the better formula for scaling than I think, you know, going all in in a season like this. If if the Bills get to the same points the Tennessee Titans are seven years from now, I would expect them to make a similar move. It, it, it's a little desperate, a little bit for yeah. sure. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think all those things you talk about to Xavier Howard just talks about the how well Brandon Bean does business and the fact that you never see guys get this gruntled. We've never had a guy hold out, you know, guys never, you know, our top players never really go into that last year of the contract without a deal. At least no, none of our guys who end up being elite, you know, we got Trey white done right away. Right. And we, you know, so, and I think it'll be something to watch, but you know, there's clearly, there's clearly something right that Bean is doing with the way he does business. And it resonates with the players on the team, but stepping away from the bills a little bit, and as we head into training camp next month and we take we t- and we look at the league as a whole and mainly the AFC, you know, the bill, this is a weird position for Buffalo, right? Mm. As me as a bill, as a millennial bills fan, as someone who grew up need the bills need to take 8 million steps to get to the next level and the Super Bowl never being something that was even breathed or talked about in the off season. The next step for Buffalo is the Super Bowl and everyone else is, they had the target on their back. Them in Kansas City, they were the two teams that got to the AFC championship team, AFC championship game. So everyone's chasing them. So what out of all these teams, what is one or two teams that you think had got closest to Buffalo and got closest to Kansas City in in uh, you know if you were doing power ranks or whatever measure yeah. you want to use? So uh, my buddies over at the Rock Power Report would tell you the obvious question or the obvious answer that I would say is the Cleveland Browns, because I think I've been saying for roughly five years, losing a lot of bets on the Cleveland Browns. I think this is actually the year they're going to win their division. Um, I've made some pretty crazy bets and pretty crazy hot takes about the Cleveland Browns, but I think you know, John Johnson, Troy Hill, um, uh, tr- um, drafting Newsom, the the corner of Northwestern, um, going to get you Davian Clowney at, a, I think, a good price. They lose Sheldon Richardson. Now, I think that does matter in the grand scheme of things. I thought that they were light up front. I thought he was their best interior defensive lineman. And now, you know, they've sort of sacrificed that interior play from Sheldon Richardson, who's a really consistent player, gets you that pass rush from the interior for a guy that – in my opinion, I think they got for a great deal with Jadavian Clowney. And of course, the idea of putting him on the opposite side of Jadavian or on uh, Miles Garrett makes a ton of sense in the world. I, I think if you're going to get the most out of Jadavian Clowney, it's putting him in a situation like Cleveland will put him in. But the question is, is never about, you know, his on field, which maybe that's not totally true. I think there are questions about his on field performance, but I do think, you know, the question has always been about his ability to stay healthy. But if he can, that's a defense that can really turn the corner. If the offense can be efficient, which is what they were last year, they weren't explosive, they weren't dynamic, but they were efficient. You add in Odell Beckham Jr. I think that is just in addition by, you know, not going to make an offseason move, but you're getting a healthy Odell Beckham Jr. Um, how about this? How about I think maybe the, the most interesting part about this whole Cleveland Brown situation is they finally have a head coach returning for the first time yeah. in, in Baker Mayfield. And that means also means a play caller returning for two straight seasons for Baker Mayfield. Does Baker Mayfield take a step? I think Cleveland makes a lot of sense as that team. Um, Baltimore is there. I, I think they were there and, you know, they're a 
interception away. You know, they're, they're a, a couple of missed field goals from a Hall of Fame kicker away um, from maybe being the, t- the AFC team uh, playing against Kansas City. So, you know, I, I think they made the moves to the receiver position that they needed to make. They lost a lot in that defense, particularly on the on the defensive line. Now they still have got those great cover corners, Marcus Peters, um, and um, but and, and Marlon Humphrey. But I, I think you, I look at it from this perspective: is I don't think it's a quarterback problem. Some people might disagree. Some people don't like Lamar Jackson. I like Lamar Jackson. I don't think it's a wide receiver problem, and it won't be this year with you know Bateman and Sammy Watkins, who's had great uh, great reviews coming out of um, minicamp. I think it's more so is Greg Roman going to hold that team back? And I think ultimately they didn't. They decided not to move away from Greg Roman as the primary play call. They did, they did bring a passing game coordinator in. I just think that at the end of the day, that offense is limited from a, schem- a, a scheme perspective and, and from a schematic perspective. And I think because of that, that's what ultimately, you know, kind of puts them behind Cleveland. I think Tennessee can, you know, you can make the argument. I, I might be in the minority here. But I really like the Carson Wentz move for Indianapolis. I think that's a team that can get slightly better quarterback play from Phillip Rivers, who had a bounce back season. Um, I think that he will be better than Phillip Rivers was. And if that means he's if he's just a little better than Phillip Rivers, that team is winning the division. And that's a much scarier matchup against the Bills in the wild card round. That's that's really interesting that you bring that up, and and I'll, I I want to set Indianapolis for a second because I think that's the more interesting conversation. I can get to what my team that I think is going to take the jump next, but I because that was my question. I literally had that in my notes. Will Carson be better? Carson Wentz be better than Philip Rivers? And I guess you know you're someone who played quarterback, so I guess I'll, I'll direct mm-hmm. this as a good question for you. That you know he has you know he last year he reverted to a lot of his mechanical flaws. And, you know, I, you know, it clearly wasn't a, a great situation for him. And there were mm-hmm. reports coming out about, you know, coaches not really being able to coach him and, you know, play people not calling him out and him just kind of having rough shot and not really taking criticism. But I guess I do you think so you think going well, I guess I'll frame it this way. What about going to Frank Reich? Do you think will make him a better quarterback? Do You think it's just having that comfortability with him? Do you think being in front of an all line, even though that they're losing Anthony Costanzo, is still probably a pretty good offensive line? Do you think it's just getting to that, or think just the fact that Philadelphia was a super toxic organization last year? Add, add all those things in there. I, I think, and you you have a I think probability with all of those negative factors would say, hey, this is a guy that could potentially be in a situation with, I think, a, a far better supporting cast. Say what you will, Michael Pittman Jr. is not an elite level wide receiver or anything like that. You know, Zach Pascal's not. Um, you know, Jack Doyle's a, a nice player, a tight end, but he's nothing crazy. It's that I think the Indianapolis Colts have the most underrated running attack and most d- diverse running attack in the league. Uh, you add in a potential healthy um why, why is his name uh, escaping me? The yeah, I, uh, Hines and uh... who is the Marlon Mack? A healthy Marlon Mack. You add in Hines, um, and you see, you saw what Jonathan Taylor was able to do his rookie season. Like that's a running attack that he's never had in terms of consistency. Their ability to be pass catchers and you know be teams on the ground. You mentioned the offensive line. I think that's a big factor. He was under duress for the last two seasons. Part of the reason that he wasn't able to stay healthy, part of the reason that he really started playing a lot of hero ball, and that was sort of ultimately his downfall. I think you start to look at the numbers you saw from Philip Rivers his last year in San Diego slash Los Angeles to his, you know, the last season and his first year in Indianapolis. Actually, you saw significant jumps up. You saw a player who was far more efficient. Um, I thought, you know, had less talent around him. I mean, he doesn't have Keenan Allen. He didn't have Mike Williams here, um, you know, playing for Indianapolis last late season. But what he did have is a great running attack and a safety valve in Naeem Hines that I think you have with Carson Wentz. So I, I, I like their ability. If Carson Wentz can get some things right, I think he's got some talent there. I think, I think they make a ton of sense for Zach Ertz. Um, I think they make more sense than the Bills. I think they could be a sneaky pickup for them um, as they get closer to training camp that I think would solidify that offense in a way that I'd say uh, they could be a problem. You know, and I, I think that I and I think it ultimately all comes down to how much can Carson Wentz be, you know, if he can be passable, if he can at least get to average because he was subjectively bad last year. Yeah, yeah, average, no, he was he was not good. Yeah, he was not good. If, if he can get to average. I think that's probably a pretty good offense. And I think that's kind of to take us back to when we were talking about Cleveland. And if we're going to, you know, I guess let's sit on the quarterbacks here for a second. 
when it comes to Cleveland, yeah, I, I had him as one of my teams. I think made a big jump, but I'm really curious that the thought that keeps going through my head with Cleveland and what they did because I think, uh, why is there Zapanski? Zapanski mm-hmm. is probably one of was one of the best play callers. I think he deserved to win Coach of the Year last year. And my only question with that team is. Is Baker Mayfield independently great, or did he have a season like a la Jared Goff or Jimmy Garoppolo yeah. that he was in a situation with great supporting talent, great play calling, and after a year or two of film on him, are people going to kind of figure him out? And that's why I think his his fifth year, when he when his extension comes, it's going to be really interesting because I'm that that's the one like I, I'm like about ninety eight percent sold, but I'm two percent. Yeah, is this another Jared Goff situation? I think I think he's closer to Jared Goff than he is Josh Allen, um, as and that's coming from someone who was a big Baker fan. I thought made a lot of sense. I thought the Bills were going to end up with Baker. I thought I didn't think Baker was going to go number one overall. Um, ultimately, I think he his success had a lot to do, and I think was a product of Stefanski's quarterback friendly offense. They were you know a lot of half field reads, the best and most dynamic running attack in the league with Chubb and Hunt. Um, that offense is going to be set up where they've got three guys at the tight end position. That's going to work for Stefanski's offense. Can they get Odell Beckham Jr. and Baker Mayfield on the same page? Because that's been the most, that's been the weirdest part about Baker and Odell Beckham is they just had the, even when Beckham was healthy, there just was not that rapport with those two. It, it did. Let me just put it this way. It was no Josh Allen and Stefan Diggs. It just wasn't that, that dynamic was not there. And Jarvis Landry has long been one of the most overrated wide receivers in all the league. He's a one trick pony. He's got, you know, three or four routes in his route tree. Um, and I, I think ultimately that offense really needs Odell Beckham to be the player that was, you know, the New York giant and, and the guy making unbelievable plays on Monday night football. So I, the question on Baker is, I think, I think that's a lot of people's question, um, is can Baker be the guy that he sometimes shows that he is and other times he doesn't? I think when he's not holding on to the football um, and he's playing more traditional, I thought he was better when he was under center, which was a surprise to me because it's not a guy that, that plays under center. He's a shotgun and, you know, wheel and deal kind of guy. And that he wasn't that in the NFL when he was holding out of the football, he was making more mistakes. Um, and I, I think at the end of the day, I think they'll be good with Baker Mayfield this year, which is going to lead them to likely giving him a big contract, which I think will be a mistake long-term. I just don't, I don't think he's a franchise quarterback. That's going to get that team, even with all the pieces around him, um, you know, over, over in, in, into a Super Bowl or even an appearance in the Super Bowl. And, you know, and it's going to be something to watch. I think, you know, yeah. by the way, by the way, they should have beat Kansas City last year in the playoffs. Oh, absolutely. I, I think when 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 Mahomes goes down, you have to capitalize on those situations. And they just they couldn't get a stop. Bills would have been in a Super Bowl if that was the case, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm with you. I, I think that was I don't I think that would have been a mad matchup for Cleveland. You know, I, I think Buffalo's defense you know they tend to do better a little bit better against the run in the playoffs and they kind of got ran over a little bit against indianapolis but they were able i I think maybe against a more traditional run attack they would have been especially if they could have forced got up early and get forced the game into baker's hand and really take the run game out of that equation i think would have been a really interesting game for sure but as we go down this list of contenders so we've talked about kansas city's a contender we've talked about Cleveland. we've talked about indy we've talked about tennessee what other teams do you think are going to be new that we aren't talking about as contenders? May not be quote Super Bowl contenders, but teams that are going to be hmm. playoff teams, teams that are going to push, that are going to maybe enter the conversation as good to elite teams in 2021 that weren't there in 2020. If Denver gets competent quarterback play, that could definitely be Denver. Um, you know, is Teddy Bridgewater the guy? Is Drew Lock going to take a step? Um, that's a good football team. They've got weapons. They've got, uh, they've got players along that defensive line. And they've, they've, I, I, that's a team that I think you could look at and say they, they invested heavily into the defensive backfield too. So they're going to be able to cover Patrick Sertain in the first round. Um, I, I like Denver a lot. It's just, you know, what are they going to do a quarterback? Is that going to be something that holds them back again? I don't think Pittsburgh's in the conversation at all. 
I, I think Pittsburgh is a five or six one football team. Um, I and and that might surprise people. Um, that that's that's just where I am on Pittsburgh. I'm very down on Pittsburgh. They let go of David DeCastro today. Uh, before prior to us, you know, recording this podcast, like who's playing offensive line? Um, for the Pittsburgh Steelers, I just I don't know. I, maybe Trey Turner. He just got cut. Maybe, maybe maybe he's a guy that Pittsburgh. I just. I don't know what Pittsburgh's doing, um, but you know Mike Tomlin alone might get him to six or seven wins. But that if they if they won five six games, that would not be a surprise to me um, at all. I, I, the Chargers, I think they're an obvious one, right? You get Derwin James back, second year um, of Justin Herbert, who I think is an elite level talent. Um, they've got the skill position. If you get a healthy Austin Eckler all season, we saw what he was able to do. That defense, you know, they've I think the NFL and and people in the media have been talking about that defense for a long time and they've never really been able to stay healthy. You, you sort of get through the Casey Hayward era. That's over with. Now it's can Derwin James stay healthy. Um, so I think that's a team. I think the AFC West has some pieces um, that could put it together. I'm not convinced that really anybody, um, you know, in, in, in the, in the South outside of, you know, Indy and, um, and Tennessee really, really, pose much of a threat. Um, and so for me, the only other team I could potentially see, um, I, I don't want to get there with the Raiders. I just, I, I can't really give credit to, to John Cruden enough to, to name them a contender. Right. And I think as you look through these divisions, even more so than last year, I mean, this is a conference that added a playoff team and 10 wins didn't make the playoffs. Like I think yeah. it's very possible that this stays deep. Like you said, you know, I had Denver on my list a team that I think is well coached. I think Vic Pangio is underrated. I think they have really good receivers. You really mm-hmm. have another team kind of like Indianapolis, where you just kind of need passable quarterback play. Yep. Exactly. Um, right. And then, you know, chargers, I think a team where Anthony Lynn was a net negative as a head coach. You don't see that a lot, but he was a net negative as a yeah. head coach of that football team. Great guy, you know, smart football mind. It seems like just not a good head coach. And, you know, I think the only other team that you didn't mention, and I'd be curious on you, I know I've seen some of your tweets on this, is, you know, I you know I like Brian Flores. I like Miami. I think that's a guy who constantly is coaching his team better than they are. I think two is obviously the big question mark. I think he didn't come out as strong as people would have hoped for. I'm a lot higher than him on other people in Bill's Mafia. But, you know, I one of the other things that I was talking, I was on Rock Pile last week, for all this love Flores does get all and as good as a coach that I think he is, I think it was very telling that they had to go into week 17 uh, on a game that didn't matter for the bills. Yeah. They got walloped. And I think that does speak, you know, you've never seen McDermott go into an important game like that and get it. Yeah. Or is absolutely beaten off besides that AFC championship game besides, but that was a really good football team. And I just think you saw, you, so there's still some questions about there. So where do you fall on, can Miami at least get into the playoffs this year? Do they have the roster? Do they have the coaching? Sure, they could be a playoff team. Um, are they a contender? No. And are they anything more than a wildcard team? No. Um, I am not a believer of Tua Tunga I I thought he would be a player in the NFL. And from the things that you saw from him in this rookie season, I know they're getting a new offense. That's also something to note. This is a totally new scheme. Um, I get all the weapons. The weapons don't make sense to me. You, you're going to get burners that are running down the field. And I just don't think that's to his game. And, and I know in college, you saw that deep, some of those deep throws. You saw one in the national championship, Devontae Smith, for that, that game winner, the game he comes in for Jalen Hurts. But I just I, I I don't think he has the chops to be the aggressive anticipatory thrower that he needs to be. Um, I think you know those outside uh, the, the opposite hash uh, sideline throws are dangerous for him. Um, so I I am not sold on Miami. Um, you know Ryan Fitzpatrick ain't walking through those doors, um, and you know Jacoby Brissett I. You know, is he better than Tua? Probably not. But I, I listen. They cut or traded all of their team captains from last year. You, you, you signed Kyle Van Noy to a huge deal to run your defense and and basically be the 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 captain of the defense. And then you cut him a, se- a season later. You you go out and sign Jack Lawson. You trade him away. Um, so I, 
you know, they're, this Xavier Howard thing um, is going to be interesting. Do they end up with another first round pick, which they honestly haven't really had super, super impressive um, first round picks. You know, last year they end up with Tua and uh, Austin Jackson, and I'm not convinced Austin Jackson's even a starter um, in the NFL. So, uh, you know, listen, they can have all the picks. Um, they, I, I like Waddle, but I, I don't think that's the right pairing for, for how you want to win with Tua. I think you want to have the short, West Coast style passing passing offense with Tua, a strong running game, and they're leaning in the total opposite direction. They didn't really, you know, invest in the running back position. I like Miles Gaskin because I got him in all my fantasy leagues, but I, am I am I crazy? Like he, this is not a guy that's going to really scare defenses or be a guy that you can turn around and hand the ball to twenty two times a game. Like you know, Najee Harris made a lot of sense. Yeah, anybody, um, uh, Travis Etienne makes a lot of sense for them. It just the and, and drafting a. Not every team should draft a running back in the first round. I didn't think the Bills were that team. I thought Miami was a, a very clear candidate for that because it's 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 a need for them if you have Tua Tunga Viola quarterback. And I just I, I don't think their defense is going to be nearly as good last year. One of the biggest, you know, when you're a team that leads the league in turnovers, that is not a thing that you typically see that is consistent year by year statistic that teams are really good at. I think they're going to bound to regress um, way closer, way closer to the mean on turnovers. And if they're not turning the ball over the way they did last year, that's not a defense that scares me at all. I just ask Josh Allen. I mean, look at his numbers against the Dolphins defense, even when they were the number one scoring and turnover defense in the league, Josh Allen was still rocking them to sleep. So, um, I, I am just not sold at all on Miami. I like Indianapolis and New York. I I think there's a better chance the Dolphins end up in the in last place in the division than second place. And uh, to your point, I think there's something to be said. You know, they had the same record as 2019 Bills, but one of the things I had in my mm-hmm. notes was you can't replicate. You, it, it is really hard to replicate turnovers and scoring defense. That's just not something that is projectable over yeah. years. Yeah. Not that it's random, but it's just it. It's you know it sort of happens. Like think about the bill. The Bills didn't have any score defensive scoring plays for like two years, and then they had three at the end of this year. Like it's just hard to mm. play that kind of stuff. Yeah. And you look at what the Bills did from nineteen to twenty. Is they brought back almost the entire defense from nineteen to twenty. They had a lot of mainstays on this defense, even going back to eighteen in some cases on this team. And my I think turning over that defense the way they did isn't doing them any favors. Yeah. So, Agreed. Turning, this, turning this back to Buffalo now, there's not a huge jump for Buffalo to make. The next jump is Super Bowl. Yeah. And that's a hard jump to make. So, if Buffalo goes to the Super Bowl or wins the Super Bowl, when we look back on this year, what's going to be the storyline? What's going to be the thing that we look at and we say, that's why they got better. That's what changed. This is why the Bills won the Super Bowl, went to the Super Bowl this year, mm. as opposed to 2020. So I was thinking about this. Um, I, I came up with a couple of things. I'm going to tell you them, but I'm going to lean into, into the one I think that will be the most important. The first one, I think the major storyline will be that Dane Jackson turns into a legitimate num- number two corner, um, takes a legitimate step, and is a guy that teams are like, we can't just throw away from Trey White. This isn't working. Like He's borderline, you know, like a really good year two player that could maybe take that year three step in two years that we saw Trey White take, right? Like that would be a big storyline to me. Another storyline, Ed Oliver becomes an elite interior pass rusher, has eight to 10 sacks, is a maven, has to be double teamed and opens things up for the edge players. But I think the one that I, the 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 third storyline that I think this could be, you know, the thing that makes us forget about Julio Jones, which is Gabe Davis taking a step from really promising rookie career, uh, rookie campaign to this is the second best wide receiver from that draft class and the deepest draft class of, you know, the last 25 years at wide receiver. And this is the, one of the best deep threats in the league. This is pound for pound. He's, he's mini DK Metcalf. If they, if he could turn into that player, um, that is a, a a reason that you think that the Bills maybe take that jump. So that's the one I'm leaning into because I think maybe it's the most realistic um, that Gabriel Davis really does take that step and becomes a complete receiver and is just a legitimate bona fide number two receiver to Stephon Diggs. And if that happens, you know, the Bills are going to be in really good shape. And if that offense takes a step, I don't know how many more steps there is for that offense to take, but I, you know, they were sixth or seventh in the league last year. If that's, if that's a number two offense, that could be the, that could be the reason why. I think it's what people really underrated about Gabe Davis's game too is I, I think much like 
and I'm glad you said I I've I've said in the B- Buffalo Fanatics family chat once that uh that Gabe is uh DK Metcalf light because of the fact that Buffalo looked at him and they said, "Hey, you're not a guy who's going to be an underneath slot guy. We're right. gonna put, we're gonna have you run posts. We're gonna have you run corners, and we're gonna line you up kind of as a power slot. And that's we're not gonna ask you to do anything you're not really built to do. And they did a really good job of that. Yeah, that's such a testament to Brian Dable. Because I don't know, if there's a bunch of teams that Gabe Davis would have walked into and had the year that he had in 2020. And the one the one that I had written in my notes is I think a storyline. Is you said Ed Oliver, I just said pressure front four pressure. Yeah. And when we talk in the front half of the show, I really like that you brought up drafting well in terms of ways of keeping your window open. I think the lack of moves this season and the seemingly lack of desire for being to kick that can down the road, quote unquote, is because they really believe that the guys that they have drafted are going to develop. And that yeah. means They've drafted in the last three years. They've drafted four got four defensive linemen in the top two rounds of the draft. You have AJ Espinosa, you have Ed Oliver, you have Gregory Rousseau, and now you have uh, Carlos Basham. And I think if you can get one of those guys, two of those guys, mainly Ed, Ed Oliver, a guy who has tons of great flashes on tape, and yeah. it's just about putting it. It's just about putting it together, finishing on sacks. I mean, he's a guy who, if you look at a lot of the advanced metrics, is beating his guys even at the one tech spot and having star there maybe finally yeah. allows him to be that disruptive guy. Cause interior, if you can get interior pressure, that is game over for a defense mm-hmm. you know, you, that, that changes everything. And then if you can have a guy like Espinessa come in and be a, a solid player and you're rotating in, if either we're so, you know, I think we're so, I know a lot of, a lot of the stuff on Rousseau is, you know, he's, he's raw and he might need the red shirt, but, I think there's something to be said for a guy who didn't really know what the hell he was doing this freshman year in Miami and walked in the 15 sacks. Like, I think there's something to that. Yeah. And, and the fact that, you know, granted a lot of the stuff that comes out of mini camp is fluff and whatnot, but mm-hmm. coach is talking about, you know, how smart he is and, and how much he picks up and how much it seems like he's just a, a football guy. And he just really looks into his craft, you know, uniquely. So, so I, I think that story and the thing that's going to change is, you know, I, I know the advanced metrics on this defensive line this year was that, was that they, you know, they got, they were one of the best pass rush win rates, all this stuff. But I think it's going to be finishing. It's going to be a team that gets sacks and really, because I think once you start to see that if they can get sacks and they can finish more regularly, that's going to help that secondary too. Oh, no question. It's going to help the secondary. It's going to help Tremaine Edmonds. Um, and and I think that's the guy that maybe I left out uh, part of the storylines. And may, and I think will probably be the answer to your next question um, as the kind of consequential player that, that you know, his step could make or break them. Yeah, yeah. So, so the segue with that question, let's say we get to the end of the season and the Bills don't get to the AFC Championship game. They lose in the AFC Championship game. They, they just they don't take that step. What are we going to be looking at? What are we going to be pointing fingers at that for the storyline that held them back in 2020 or 20, or 2021? Excuse me. I think the you look back at the 2018 draft and you talk about the it's just it's too consequential. And I think the two players and I'll start the defensive side is Tremaine Edmonds is if Tremaine Edmonds cannot make that jump, the jump that we saw Josh Allen make in year three that I think I, I know I was expecting him to make in year three Tremaine Edmonds. He just didn't. Um, and it doesn't mean he was bad. It just meant and it didn't get worse. He just didn't get better. And, and I think that's really what I'm looking to see from him this year. And, and if he doesn't make that jump, if he remains the same player, um, you know, they're going to be in a tight spot because I, 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 they, they need him to be an elite level player. I mean, that that's a first round pick. And if, and, and all the potential that he has as a player, I mean, he's 23 years old, he's still so young, but they need him. And, and if he, if he can't take that step, I think that could be a big reason, but I think you'd be crazy if you said that the the one storyline, if they don't make the jump, it's because Josh Allen either regressed closer to the player that we saw his second season um, or just, you know, maybe just got slightly worse, but d- isn't a player that, that, you know, Chris Sims is saying is the second best quarterback in the league and, and, and in his top 40 ranking. Um, that isn't the player that uh, was number two in, in, in MVP voting, voting behind um, Aaron Rodgers. If he's not that player and that was just a one year thing, um, that's, that's your biggest reason right there. And, and I'm glad you said that because I think, I think it's reasonable to be curious about what the mean is on Josh Allen. Yeah. I, 
I've been I've been defending Josh Allen since day one. I was pumped he took the jump this year. I was expecting to take a jump this year. I didn't think he was going to be second MVP voting jump. Right, right. I, I Who think, could? Who would know that? Yeah. Well, exactly. It was unprecedented. But I think it's also reasonable because that jump was so unprecedented. I think it's reasonable to say, all right, he's not. Like, he's not going to be the second in MVP voting every year. The mean is going to be somewhere below that. What is that mean going to be? That's a and for me, if you take if you if you take a a slight step back at this really high ceiling, but you add more consistency and you bring that floor up a bit, I'm I wouldn't even think that that's a bad thing. If Josh Allen could have because you know you saw these games, you saw the Jets where they they don't score an offense touchdown and then they score five touchdowns against Seattle and you score you know one touchdown against uh, the Ravens in the AFC Championship game, but you score you know eight touchdowns against the Denver Broncos who have a good defense. So it's just like if you could have less of those real peaks, if if you're telling me the peaks are not second in MVP voting type player. But you bring in the floor up. I still I, that doesn't mean he won't he won't step up. He won't still be the second in MVP voting. In fact, maybe that's what helps him take the next step is less of those peaks and and those moments where maybe he's thrown for five touchdowns and, and thrown for 435 yards, but he has more of those 290, 320 yard games. And there's that consistency, and they're moving the ball, and they're possessing the football, and keeping it away from other teams' defenses, and forcing other teams' offenses to be one-dimensional, and trying to chase after this offense that's efficient, that stays on the field, that has that that's smart on first down, that is one of the past happiest teams on first down, that makes it in third and short situations, but converts and doesn't settle for field goals, and 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 can again, I think the big thing, possess the football. Those are all things where. If he can just be more consistent and maybe not be so peaky, maybe that is him taking the step, right? So I, it's it's an interesting the the dynamic of Josh and 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 his peaks and valleys in this conversation in that context. I think is um you know the interesting way to spin it a little, right? And it, it'll be interesting to see what it looks like with fans in the stands this year, and if we see any return to Sugar High Josh, and you know what what's it going to be like when he has to go back to some of that silent communication in the at the line of scrimmage and stuff like that. Cause I think that was a real thing this year. Not that I think it's going to be something super measurable, but I think it's something to keep an eye on. And oh yeah. We, as we head into the season, cause they just didn't have to deal with that that year. I think that was a benefit to quarterbacks. And I think offenses talked about that being a benefit to them. But the, the one point that I also really like that you hit on is I, I had it written down as lack of development from rookie contract players. If, the guys I talked about the pass rush in the front end. If AJ Espinessa doesn't mm-hmm. step up, if like you said, Tremaine doesn't step up, Ed, if you know they can't get better production out of CB two, yep, that's gonna be it. And people will be looking at the thing is it's gonna be one of two things. People are gonna look at are gonna sit at the end of the season and say, "Wow, Brandon Bean was great. He was patient with Dawson Knox. He was patient with Tremaine Edmonds, and you know, and it's people are gonna really be singing his praises. Or if they don't take that jump, I think it's gonna be a lot of people who say they should have been more aggressive and shouldn't have banked Mm. on those guys to take that step up. And I don't think it's a bad strategy. I think showing faith in your guys that you drafted is part of the reason why they built such a strong culture is that you're not that that they're not bringing the competition, but they they're showing that they trust the guys that they have in the building. And I, you know, picking up that fifth year option, I think was huge for Tremaine Edmonds. Yeah. Just from a confidence standpoint, I'm fine. If, if he doesn't take the step up, I'm fine eating that, whatever it's going to be, $12 million down the road. But it's ultimately that the Bills bank 2021 on being able to develop the guy yeah. they have on this team. And I think that's ultimately what it will come down to. Yeah, me too. The the player development is always going to be the 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 major key of sorts. And I and I think, you know, your point about Brandon Bean too, it's – you're right. Uh, they're, that uh, – that – the way that he has built it, he has rewarded guys that everyone in the locker room knows should be rewarded. And I think that's a, that's the kind of thing that you can kind of continue to build that that culture that's within this locker room. Um, but you're right. If Dawson Knox doesn't work out, everyone's going to be second guessing whether or not they should have got Zach Ertz. And if, you know, um, Daryl Williams takes a, 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 a fall, right. Or, and, and is it, and is it the player that, that, that he was last year, they'll say, well, they should have went outside him. They should have got another, somebody else to play off to play right tackle. So, yeah, I mean, the, I think there's always going to be those, those types of moves, particularly particularly with Tremaine Edmonds, but I, I think at the end of the day, you know, this team is built, they're not all in. And, and I was actually going to mention too, with all the depth that they created the linebacker position this off season. I mean, they, 
they put, I mean, Ty- Tyrell Adams, they, they went out and, and they solidified the linebacker position behind Tremaine Edmonds. So if he fails or he's hurt, or if, uh, if, if, if Matt Milano misses any extended time, they've got guys now where last year they just did not. So I, I, I agree with you though, that there's a lot riding on this season and some of the really I, player development is always important, but I think more so for the bills than, than a lot of other teams it is. Absolutely. And, you know, hindsight will always be 2020. I think it'll be a really interesting conversation at the end of the year, but I think that's a really good period on the conversation. Um, so, Nate, I'm really grateful you came on as someone, you know, I was a Bills season ticket holder driving in from Rochester growing up and lives in the WGR. So this was really, really cool for me to yeah, man. have someone come on. Do uh, you got anything to plug while you're here? Sure. Yeah. Um, my normal Saturday show, uh, sports talk Saturday on WGR, it's 11 to two every Saturday. Um, I just kind of bring on a whole bunch of guests, friends of mine, not, you know, strangers that I I've never met in, in person, but I interview, I love interviewing people. I love having conversations. So I do a lot of that, um, on my show. And like I said, uh, on demand, we are, you can check us out, uh, through the app, through Odyssey, um, or, um, just on WGR on your own uh, old, old school radio dial. If you, if people still have those, I don't know. <laughs> I listen to all my radio digitally now, but um, yeah, no, um, this was fun, man. I, I'm happy to happy to do it. Happy to come on anytime. But listen, I mean, I I, I tell people often, I um, you know, my my gig, I I am very lucky. I it's it's a dream come true type of situation for me. I went to to Frontier High School, which is the town of Hamburg, which borders Orchard Park, but where my high school was, it's on the same street. It's right off Southwestern. Uh, my football field is. 400 yards, 300 yards off of Southwestern Boulevard, uh, a mile and a half away from the stadium. So, I mean, I grew up, you know, walking, you know, when I was 16, 17 years old, walking to Bills games and walking back. So, like, I grew up pretty darn close. Um, so, you know, that that drive in for me, listening to for a long time when 97 Rock had it and Rich, listening to Rich Gensler and, um, you know, now or, or even, you know, in the in the more recent future, listening to, you know, show up in Bulldog when I was a kid, listening to Howard Simon, now working with the guys. It's it's fun. I am. Um, I, I have a blast. So, uh, yeah, if you uh, if anyone wants to. You know, tune in uh, while they're doing their uh, their Saturday errands, or throw the old Walkman on while you're mowing your lawn. I'm I'm happy to uh, to guide you through your your early Saturday afternoon. And I know I check that out regularly, so make sure you check out WGR and Nate and at Nate Geary Sports on Twitter. Make sure you check out the show at Five Eight Five Report. I'm at Sports Rock Two on Twitter. Make sure you check out all the great stuff we got going on on BF Nightly on YouTube and on our Buffalo Fanatics Podcast Network. Uh, this is a great show. This will also be at, we're also on YouTube now. So if you don't want to listen to this via podcast anymore, check it out on YouTube. Uh, have a great day. Um, that's all I got. Bye, guys.